Hello and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. I'm your host, Ron Rivers. It's October 4th, and today we're going to discuss the IRS, the armed militia movement, Mark Zuckerberg, and explore technology from multiple perspectives. But I I just want to start this episode in appreciation for Senator Bernie Sanders and wishing him a speedy recovery. You know, it's it's scary to be reminded that we're all human, uh, and I think this hurts home for many of us. Uh, when it comes to Bernie, but he's come closer to immortality uh, than many people could ever hope to. And you know, just through the sheer force of his will, right? he shaped a movement over decades that has inspired an evolution in thought. So wishing you well, Senator. Moving on, on Wednesday, ProPublica reported that the IRS admitted they are auditing the working poor at the same rate as the wealthiest 1%. The reason? It's the most cost-effective thing to do, given their limited resources. Over the past nine years, Congress has cut the IRS enforcement budget by 25%. The result is an organization that cannot afford the talent and time required to audit wealthy people. How convenient. So let's take a moment to contrast for a bit what the IRS is like now uh, compared to what it was like before the budget cuts. So uh, now the IRS is down a third of its staff. Um, The last time that the IRS had fewer than 10,000 revenue agents was 1953, um, and the economy was one-seventh of its current size. It goes on to report that the IRS conducted 675,000 fewer audits in 2017 than they did in 2010, a 42% decrease in audits. The reduction translates into at least $3 billion of lost revenue per year. So if you paid your taxes this year, like I did, just remember how there are wealthy people and corporations all around the United States who aren't paying theirs. Now, according to IRS Commissioner Charles Reddick, the only solution, quote, Congress must fund the IRS, must hire and train appropriate numbers of auditors to have approximately balanced coverage across all income levels. So who benefits from this drastic reduction in enforcement? Corporations and the very wealthy. I think we'd be naive not to confront the reality of our situation. The entire structure of the IRS as it stands now, taxing the poor and avoiding corporations and the wealthy, is by design. It's working exactly as it is intended to do. This isn't a Democrat or Republican thing. This is a corporatocracy thing. And that's, that's partly because we've only begun to realize the, the new era of political leadership Um, So many of our existing and historical elected officials are beholden to their corporate sponsors. Thinking progressively, we need to come to terms with Democrats and Republicans have worked together to create social institutions that reinforce inequality. So what's a progressive to do? Well, we can begin with the obvious. We have to fully fund the IRS. More importantly, we have to fundamentally rearrange the priority of audits. Um, After we get back up to speed and we adjust to a full funding schedule of audits, we can begin to collect data to measure what was lost over the past decade in total. Um, We should look out for the largest benefactors and essentially follow the money. If evidence turns up that these gains were ill-gotten as per the law, then surely restitution is due. Uh, But the problem so often, right, with restitution is that money becomes a replacement uh, or even a retreat from actually dealing with the problem. You know, and we have to recognize that elected leadership structured our publicly owned tax system, the system that we give money to to fund social projects, they structured that system to prey on the working poor the most. So-called leaders designing systems to prey on the weak. Leaders who allow the continuous poisoning of our planet, hiding it from the people who trust them the most and making millions doing it. What amount of monetary concession could ever deliver justice? Right, but now, now we're faced with a philosophical question. What is justice in this situation? Do we let those who overwhelmingly benefited from this structure move forward without penalty? 
the rational argument might be that we've suffered enough and we should just move forward. And, and the Trumps can live in shame and dishonor for the remainder of their days. And we could also approach it from the perspective of, of moving forward is, is technically not wasting time and more time on the past, which I think is a, a good argument, right, um, to begin instead the work of progress. Unfortunately, while the approach is practical, I think it ignores our responsibility to the ethos of our society. All societies function on established codes of ethical commitments to some extent. But those codes, like everything else in society, are derived and created by the people. And as everything else in the universe, they are subject to change. Uh, so we can willingly choose and direct the ethos of our society. So we have to say, if, if we allow this behavior to go um, just, you know, the slap on the wrist, what are the long-term impacts on the psyche, culture, and belief of the Americans as a people? Uh, wh what happens when that becomes normalized. I mean, with the bar being so low and, and Donald Trump's, you know, appeal being the shock factor, the, the you know, shake things up factor, you know, just the, the disruptor, a mask, but, you know, to some, a, a convincing mask. So I think we just need to be cognitive and conscious of that aspect of harm uh, long-term in the ethos of our society. Look, at the end of the day, if justice is truly blind, then we have to make it blind. Um, so often, these kind of crimes just get, you know, slap on the wrist and get ahead. Um, but there is there's tremendous damage that has been done uh, and in many directions uh, that is going to take time to fix. Now, I'm not a lawyer, right? But we can imagine that the legal argument would be to find a way to saying what they were doing was legal at the time, right? Absolving them of the crime. That would be a strong defensive argument. But what weight does law hold when it was designed to intentionally create disparity within society? You know, in other words, the people who wrote the bill are the same people who benefited from the bill. The benefit is extracted from the collective wealth of society, your wealth, my wealth, our wealth, and the lawmakers partnered with corporations to turn our tax system into a parasite. We are the host of this parasite. How does justice apply to a law when the law itself is injustice? So in recognition of the broader relationships, we might explore what legal ramifications we might enact to reverse this injustice. If we applied this process at a scaled and increasingly automated level throughout society, would we be able to identify trends, repeat offenders? How do we establish a threshold for the damage caused by institutional oppression? Of course, this same question can be applied in many different directions in American society right now. So it begs us the question, right? How far will we go? And that's a good question. But the answer is, is actually pretty straightforward. It's however far we can imagine. And I think that is the only thing limiting us right now. Um, and it's important to recognize that we have the capability to make an emergent leap. But only if we viewed Earth more systemically as a combined system. Compare that to the present nation-state model, which is really just a minor evolution above monarchy. Uh, it, it's, it's both within our potential and our grasp, but it requires the work to continue and grow. So, you know, I, I do want to get a little off track for a moment. Uh, recently, I had the pleasure of hanging out and being the guest on a brand new podcast that's going to be coming out soon that I'm, I'm definitely going to share when it's, it's released. Uh, and the hosts are three intelligent, diverse, talented college grads with a variety of perspectives on the world. And, and I, I found their vantage points fascinating. Um, one thing that stuck out to me was a deep dissatisfaction of the other, right? The opposing viewpoint. And it seems to me that we may be allowing ourselves to dehumanize one another. And I have to say, that is part of a larger vision to divide us, and we are becoming blind to it by, by buying into it. We must resist this at all costs. Because if we fall prey to this belief, then violence is inevitable. We already have a section of our population that believes that. We cannot fall prey to that as progressives. 
So I'll, I'll wrap it up there because that's, that's kind of a conversation for another time. But just keep that in mind. You know, we're going to have to reconcile with all this at some point. And um, it, it's going to be a much smoother and mutually beneficial transition if we are inclusive. And inclusive means inclusive, even with those who would threaten us today. So that's a nice segue into Trump's recent call for a coup. The Oath Keepers are a militia group that identifies with what we label as far-right ideals. They have a Twitter following of a little over 24,000, and boy, are they excited about Trump's recent tweet about a coup. Recently, we released Thinking Progressive number 9, titled Trump 2024 and the Progressive, about Trump's call for violence. And we explored possibilities about what a progressive pathway forward might look like. Um, I'll spoil the ending. You know, we leave with love. There's no other way. But I'll leave it at that because we've kind of talked about that at length. Moving on, there's a, a lot of drama surrounding Mark Zuckerberg's internal memo leak. In the transcript, Mark discussed resisting a government attempt to break up Facebook citing his faith in the quote-unquote rule of law. You know, the memo along with the other sources of information that we're pulling from is always linked in the sources section below. It's an interesting read, um, and it covers a number of topics. So it, it's clear that Mark had a vision of Facebook beyond what others understood. What wasn't clear to me is just how deeply he believes his own story he's crafting for himself. And look, I'm not going to deny his accomplishments or foresight, um, but I do challenge his belief in his righteousness to hold the power he does. Um, laws can and will be changed. You know, outside the Messiah complex, uh, I thought his insights on TikTok, virtual reality, and why he refused to testify around the world were, were actually pretty interesting. I'd recommend you read it. It's, it's not too long. So moving on to some interesting technology news. So NASA is testing a drill bit to dig and test for life. According to NASA's website, this drill, developed in partnership with Honeybee Robotics, is attached to a rover carrying a suite of instruments. These tools can analyze the soil samples dug up by the rover and discover potential biosignatures of microbial life. Now, let's explore the concept of finding life and what that might do for society for a moment. So right off the bat, I think it would, it would do a lot of different things in a lot of different directions. I think for many of us, it would be an inspiring message of hope, prosperity, and cooperation. Uh, that would certainly be the, the progressive approach, a mobilized effort to, you know, get our shit together so we can begin to really explore this universe beyond this planet. Um, and, and, you know, within that, you know, in that process, discover who we really are because we can be so much more than we are. Um, but as we've discussed earlier in the news, our systems are designed to oppress. So it becomes a little challenging uh, to overcome these institutions that seem are insurmountable uh, to accomplish this you know, goal that seems incredible, but we have the ability uh, to do it. So that's you know, the message I would take from hearing about it. That would excite me um, to know. But we also might imagine that it would create you know, some, some conflict in society. We imagine, I think it would present some challenges to stricter religious sects. And I mean, I'll leave it at that. that that's a spiritual discussion for them to have. Uh, amongst themselves. I think if you look at the Eastern religions, any bacterial life would be the same God as you or I. I mean, it, it would, they're all one. So uh, it's a, we are a manifestation of it, right? That's Hinduism. So it's, it's really fascinating, but you know, I think that it, it really could be a uniting message. So I'm excited. Growing up, I had a, a family member working at NASA, so it always excites me to hear news about space uh, and what we're doing and just how far we've come. So on that note, I just want to thank all of you uh, once again so much for tuning in to this Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. I hope you have a great weekend, and I'm really looking forward to next week's episode as well. Uh, and one final ask, if you enjoyed this episode and the direction we're kind of taking this, uh, please make sure you subscribe to the channel uh, and like this episode. If you really like it and you like where we're going, share, share it and let people know. My objective with the channel is to not only talk about progressive policies and issues, but also to explore uh, viewpoints of the world uh, to kind of really understand where we are and, and more importantly, where we want to go. Thanks so much. I'll see you next week.